Hi everyone, it's Mel here and welcome back to the YouTube channel for another video. Today I'm going to do a Q&A for you guys. I'm sitting here on my couch, I've got some really good questions and here comes Penelope to help out with the questions. Do you want to come and help? Okay, come on, up! Up! Good girl! And Essie! Am I going to go on any more cruises and where is the next destination? That is a really good question. At the moment, there definitely are not any cruises in the horizon. Uh, however, I would love to obviously do more. P&O Australia do some cruises up into Queensland around the Great Barrier Reef and stuff. So that will probably be the next destination. I won't leave Australia for a while, but I will definitely look at doing something in Queensland, go to places like Cairns and Airlie Beach and some of those places that I've never been. The next person has said, I've seen that you played football and I'm keen to know how you manage. So for those of you who are not aware, I will post a photo eventually. I play Australian rules football with my local disability team. Australian rules football is very complicated and really hard to explain for those of you who don't know about it. It's basically an oval shape with two lots of goals at either end and you kick the ball through the goals and get a point and so on and so forth. The ball is a really funny shape. It's uh, an oval shaped ball. Anyway, the way I play the sport is I have a sighted guide who is permitted to be on the field with me. Her and I are attached to each other with a running rope, so a, a little short rope that's about a quarter of a metre long that we both have in our hands and she guides me with that rope. And then when I get the ball, because I play full forward, which is the person who gets the ball and kicks the goal, my cider guide gives me the ball, then she turns me around to face the goals and tells me how far away I am and what angle I'm on so that I can make my kick and get the ball through the goals. The next question is, what are the contributing factors that have given you your confidence to do and try so many things and to be successful at them? That is an absolute doozy of a question that I'm not really sure how to answer. Um, I think, I think the thing for me has been that I had a lot of confident blind and vision impaired people around me from an early age. Um, you know, I had a very confident grandmother, I had a very confident parents, have a very confident auntie and lots of other people around me who are blind or have low vision who have got some pretty amazing skills. And so seeing them be confident has made me confident. The other thing is having access to orientation and mobility training, occupational therapy training, um, being able to read braille, access computers, all of that kind of stuff has also made me confident because I know I've got the skills to manage without eyesight. So having all the access to the different people and resources that I've had has been an advantage and starting off with family who knew about being blind, it wasn't something that was sprung on them when I was, you know, six or seven months old and they'd never met a blind person before. That was also a massive part of it. 
The next question, as a guide dog user, do you like to carry a cane with you? Absolutely. Oh my gosh, darned yes. If I leave town with my guide dog, I will have a cane with me. It would be very unusual for me to travel out of town with no cane. And if I did go down to the city without one, I would actually feel quite lost. The reason for that is you can whip the cane out and feel around you and you can't swing the dog around looking for a rubbish bin or a step or a something if you don't know where it is. The other reason why I like to have a cane with me is if I'm on the train and I need to go to the bathroom because we have bathrooms on the train, I don't have to muck around trying to get the dog to walk through the carriage. I can leave the dog in my seat tethered and use my cane to get to the bathroom without people giving me filthy looks if I accidentally bump into them. You know, I've got the identification of being blind by using my cane to go to the bathroom. The other thing is when I go somewhere I've never been before or I haven't been very often, I will quite often use my cane in my right hand whilst my dog is actually guiding me because I want to be able to feel where I'm putting my feet. Um, I don't have very good balance and I do get quite nervous when I'm not able to see where I'm putting my feet when I'm walking and my dog walks at a quite um, quite a reasonable pace. So it's better that I can feel where I'm going to put my feet uh, with my cane when I'm using my dog when I'm in an unfamiliar environment. The other thing about having a cane as a guide dog handler for me is I can go anywhere with a cane that I can go with my dog and if for some reason my dog is unwell or when my dog retires or something like that, I can't take her. I need to know that I'm confident and comfortable using my cane in those kinds of environments. So I will quite often practice using my cane going for a walk down the street or I'll take my cane to a football match instead of the dog or something like that. Instead. Next question is, do you use any mobility aids other than your dog and cane? Short answer is yes. Uh, I have very good mental mapping skills. I'm very good with spatial awareness. I use echolocation quite a lot. Um, and they're three things that are kind of inbuilt, if you like. Um, I also sometimes will use apps on my phone for looking up things like when the next train is coming, when the next tram is coming, stuff like that. Generally when I'm out walking with my dog or my cane, I am using echolocation and um, my spatial awareness and things like that. I don't usually use a secondary mobility aid such as a mini guide or a GPS or some kind of an obstacle detector. Um, I just prefer to use my dog and my cane uh, and my inbuilt skills. The next question is, what is your favorite book at the moment? It's, it's really hard for me to answer this one. I've been sort of on and off reading a few different things lately. To go to sleep, I've been listening to the Potter books again for like the millionth time. But my most preferred recent read is A Beautiful Day in the Neighbourhood movie tie-in book, which is uh, about the movie about Fred Rogers that starred Tom Hanks that came out a few years ago. Um, and there's a companion book uh, for that movie. I've just read it and it's... I mean, I'm a massive Fred Rogers fan. I've discovered Fred Rogers during COVID and I've really fallen in love with him. Um, sadly, he's obviously no longer with us, but I'm, I really enjoy 
finding out as much about Fred Rogers as I can and and I've watched the movie a couple of times now and having read that book and reading the full essay of um that the movie was written about was was really interesting and I I certainly had to had to take a a few moments after I read that it was um yeah pretty pretty touching the other thing that I've also been reading a lot of lately is I've been taking another seriously deep dive into the Titanic um, I recently read the book about uh, discovering the Titanic which was about the launch to find the Titanic wreck in the 1980s so that was a good book too I couldn't say I don't I have a favorite at the moment because I've just been reading and, and watching a lot because I've been sick for the last few weeks as well. But yeah, they're sort of my top. The top next thing. question is, how on earth did you have the nerve to travel around Sydney on your own? Because it must have taken a lot of guts to do that. Well, was it guts or was it stupidity? Nobody really knows. Um, no, there was actually a method behind my madness. So. When I went up to Sydney, the video that you guys saw was just me traveling to a rugby match. Now, I actually was up there for a week uh, doing some work for somebody in Sydney. So when I went up to Sydney, I made a time to spend a couple of hours with a guide dog mobility instructor from guide dogs new south wales to learn how to get from where i was staying to where i was going to be needing to be for the work that i was doing so her and i did a session uh, on that route and then i was staying with a friend who was able to show me how to get to the bus stop that you saw me find in that video. And the good thing about the route from the accommodation to the, the work was that Sydney Central Station, you had to go through to get to the work. So I'd been in that area when I was going to work. So I knew where I was going to try and find the platform uh, when I got on the train to Cronulla to go to the football. The other thing about that was I had done the route to work twice before I went to the football. So I had it pretty well practiced in my head. As you saw, I did make a couple of mistakes there, but they weren't really big ones. And I managed to use Ira to fill in the gaps that I didn't know exactly where things were. I think the reason why I chose to do it was because I had learnt it and I felt pretty comfortable catching the bus and and catching the train and everything. And I mean, I had caught trains in Sydney quite a bit before, so I was pretty comfortable doing that. So, and I've, you know, my, my, my goal was to go to the football and I wanted to achieve that goal. So, having to spend a bit of effort and do that uh, do that travel route was certainly worth it in the end. So the next comment has come in. Someone has said that they noticed a lot of things on the footpath in my last travel vlog that I was talking about. And she was wondering how blind people manage those bikes and and street furniture and things like that on the footpath that sighted people might not necessarily think twice about. Now, it's actually really interesting to me that you mention it because when I think back to filming uh, the vlog traveling around in Sydney, I actually don't remember knocking into a single thing once. I know there were a few things that I came close to but I don't remember noticing uh, street furniture very much. The thing is, when you're traveling around with a dog, they are an obstacle avoider. So the dog is trained to find the clearest, straightest path uh, towards your destination. 
So I could walk past an outdoor cafe with 500 tables and not know that there was a single table because my dog sees the object and moves around it. The white cane is what we call an obstacle detector. So it will pick up an obstacle that is in my way and then I have to find my own way around the obstacle. So really the thing about it is you need to, if you do pick up an obstacle with your cane, you need to be able to figure out what side the road is on, um, maybe which side you should go around the obstacle to get the safest path, i.e. if the road is on your right, you need to go left so that you're going towards the shop front instead of towards the road. You need to think about like how, how many other people are there around you as well so you're not bumping into people when you're trying to get around objects. Personally, I like to do what's called shorelining if I can. Now, shorelining is a technique by which you walk close to the shop front if there's a shop front available. And with a bit of luck, there won't be any street furniture in front of the walls of the shop so that you're able to use a shorelining technique. Now, if that isn't possible some local council areas it's not a bylaw to leave the shop front clear then unfortunately you do have to go around stuff all the time but yeah it's it's up to the person's skills and like I said as a dog handler I've got a really good dog she's trained to walk around objects and if someone didn't tell me that I was walking past a row of 15 motorbikes with my guide dog, they wouldn't know. So that is the amazing list of questions. I love that so many of them were mobility and dog related. I haven't had too many mobility and dog related questions in the past. So thank you for that. If you think of any questions that you forgot to ask me this time that you would like to know the answers to, please put them in the comment section down below. I'll do another Q&A at some point. Also, if you've got any suggestions that you have for content that you want to see me do, let me know in the comments down below. I hope you have enjoyed this video. I hope you have learned something and I hope that you've had a really good day. We'll see you next time. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to Mel's Blind Life and click the bell notifications and I'll see you next time.